You know, I thought of you and I wanted to talk to you today because most of our conversations are about vital issues of U.S. national security, foreign policy, and the hot war going on right now in Ukraine. Um, if there were an international crisis that the Gang of Eight had to be briefed on, <clears throat> it strikes me that there isn't a Gang of Eight. Yeah, no, it's a problem. I mean, um, we're in a funny moment right now, Nicole. I'm not sure out there in America how many people are, you know, as interested as a lot of us are in the fact that the Republicans can't elect a speaker. But this has very serious implications, yes, for national security. But also, look, at the end of the day, this Congress is going to need to figure out a way to raise the United States debt ceiling. We've had that fight over time. And what really worries me about what you're seeing right now is that if the, if the Republican majority can't even elect a speaker, how are we going to preserve the full faith and credit of the United States? States government when it comes time to raise the debt ceiling, much less anything else. And what really worries me, Nicole, is that um, I'm not sure your reporting got it, what, what an unbelievable amateur hour this has been. Each vote has not helped McCarthy. It has hurt McCarthy. After the second ballot yesterday, he lost uh, Byron Roberts, right? Um, on the, I guess it was fourth or fifth vote. I'm losing track. He lost uh, Victoria Sparks, who voted present. So each and every ballot is actually moving away from Kevin McCarthy. And he's had months to prepare for this. So again, you know, there is a temptation to look at the other party and say, oh, man, are they screwing this up? But this is going to be a, uh, you know, a, 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 it has portents of whether this country can govern itself in the next two years. Congressman, I don't disagree with you about, about sort of missing the mark. I, I wonder, too, if, if we're all missing the mark on something bigger, that these 20 voting against McCarthy aren't interested. I mean, th there's sort of a, a, a rigidity in our thinking that they want to arrive at a resolution. Are you sure that they want to resolve this? Or do you think that this, I mean, this is what our adversaries like to see America do, writhe around in dysfunction and political paralysis? Do you think those 20 would like to have a speaker by the end of the day today and go on to the business of governing with you? Uh, no, I don't. Um, but again, I think those of us who uh, work inside the Beltway sometimes get caught up in this. I mean, compared to sort of the political dysfunction that, say, the state of Israel has been through in the last couple of years or any other countries, you know, we're, we're actually still doing OK. Again, what I worry about is what this portends for the future. Now, let me give you a little bit of insight. I'm not necessarily very good at this, but you gave you a little bit of insight into that group of 20. Um, it's, a, it's a diverse group. It's an interesting and diverse group. And the reason I think David Jolly is right is because, first of all, that group has been getting bigger, not smaller. Every yeah. ballot has given them more energy, right? And I will tell you, too, from conversations, I won't say with whom, but with certain high-profile members of that group of 20, I think there's five, six, seven, maybe eight of them who, um, who there is nothing you can give them other than Kevin McCarthy's head, right? Mm. And I've actually heard one of them say it, which is, look, we're open to anything. We're open to negotiation. We're just not going to do it with Kevin. I heard one of them say, because Kevin lied to me and then he lied about me. So this has become deeply personal for at least a half dozen people uh, on that side. And those half dozen people, they, you know, McCarthy can't af afford to lose them. So if you're able to walk around the floor or the building or wherever you, I mean, you're on the Intel, so you've got a better than, than normal skill set. But if you're able to learn that, how did Kevin McCarthy not know the votes weren't there? Well, back to my point about amateur hour, right? I mean, and again, that may sound like a Democrat sort of, you know, taking a cheap shot. We have not been here in a century, Nicole, 100 years precisely since the speaker allowed for a vote that, you know, went more than one ballot, 100 years. And again, maybe there's a theory where you're going to start with, you know, five or six votes short. That was a theory yesterday morning, right? Mm -hmm. But they started with 19 votes short and the number got bigger over time. My understanding, I wasn't there, but my understanding was that in the, Republican conference meeting yesterday morning, you know, Kevin did two things. He berated uh, the 20 or so rebels and he said, I have earned this job. So it strikes me that going into the game with a message of entitlement and with threats was exactly the wrong thing to do. And again, I take no joy in that because this mm -hmm. country has serious things it needs to do in the next two years. And if it's amateur hour, how are we going to get those things done? In your conversations with the five or six members of the 19 to 20 not voting for McCarthy, do they express um, any names of other people they'd like to see? Like, do you know who the not Kevin alternative is? 
Well, it's been sort of strange, right? There was a rumor circulating in the Republican side yesterday that the Democrats were going to arrange to have 20 or 30 Democrats not show up to vote present to reduce the number of votes that McCarthy would need. And we would do that in the service of, I don't know, getting committee chairs. By the way, it was totally made up. It was totally mm -hmm. made up. And there's that sort of famous moment of a conversation between my colleague Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talking to Paul Gosar, not a typical conversation. <laughs> and she was sort of, she was setting him straight and saying, no, no, believe Believe me, we have not agreed to any deal like that. And so there's just a lot of weird misinformation. And again, um, you know, don't take it from a Democrat. It has been 100 years since we've seen anything like that. And we're talking about the third most powerful position in the United States of America that was just so incredibly badly mismanaged. Do you think that, well, let me ask you this. Should, should the House adjourn? I mean, is that the best thing for the body? Is that, is that, and if Kevin McCarthy wants that, does he have the votes to adjourn? Will you give them to him? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. In fact, there's a, there's, you may see that coming up. When I left the floor 20 minutes ago, um, the notion was that after this last ballot, uh, that there would be an, a motion to adjourn and that the Democrats might support it so that we just all go away, right? Now, <laughs> it's not that late in the day, but I think there's also sort of this notion developing, you heard David Jolly say it, that um, you know, if we all go our separate ways or whatever, that's it for Kevin McCarthy. Um, now, this, he has spent his year, his, his life in the service of this ambition. So now you have sort of a personal um, psychological question of when does Kevin McCarthy realize that what he's worked for for very many years is just not going to happen? And until he makes the decision and realizes it, is it, that that is true, look, you can adjourn, you can bring us back, but we've now had six ballots where the results have been progressively worse for Kevin McCarthy. So how you decide to let that keep running is, is, is beyond me. Do you have any personal feelings about Kevin McCarthy not being the speaker? I mean, Kevin McCarthy moved into the speaker's office. Kevin McCarthy thought Kevin McCarthy was going to be the next speaker. Um, how do you feel about somebody else? Well, um, you know, I'm a sucker for the kind of West Wing uh, thinking that is starting to burble up there, which is, could you put together a bipartisan coalition, you know, that maybe the Democrats would trade certain votes, certain committee membership, you know, co-chairs of committees in favor of supporting somebody who, you, you know, you hear Fred Upton's name mentioned, a very moderate Republican. I'm a sucker for that sort of thinking because I really do believe in bipartisanship. And McCarthy has obviously not distinguished himself by bipartisanship. Now, I'll tell you this, though, and I know I speak for each and every last one of us Democrats, which is that not a single one of us are breaking um, to help Kevin McCarthy or any other Republicans until our leader, um, Hakeem Jeffries, negotiates something that is consistent with the values and the progress that we've made over these last couple of years. So don't hold your breath for that until, until the Republicans come to us and say, you know, we need you guys and here's what we're willing to negotiate. Do you want to give us a theory of the case? I mean, you're part of the body. You know more people on the other side of the aisle than, than many of your Democratic colleagues. I mean, what is your sense of how this plays out and when it ends? So my bet, and this has been my bet for the last couple of days, and I'm stronger in my belief in this than I was two days ago, which is that the Republican conference can end this really quickly by choosing somebody other than Kevin McCarthy. And again, that has nothing to do with Jim Himes' feelings about Kevin McCarthy. It has to do with the conversations I've had with a handful of the rebels on that side. My guess mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I think this is very painful for my friends on the other side of the aisle. Uh, you know, a lot of the rebels have gotten the camera time and the fame that they were looking for. They're now legitimately legitimate anti-establishment warriors, but it is getting a little bit painful here. So my best guess, hmm. Nicole, is that if they settle on somebody else, maybe it's Steve Scalise, maybe it's Jim Jordan, maybe it's Fred Upton, I don't know who it is. But anyway, if they settle on somebody else, I think that takes a very big step forward in a constructive way for the Republicans. Congressman-elect Jim Himes, thank you very much for spending some time with us. I hope the next time we talk, you're a congressman again, but I guess we won't hold our breath anymore. And we're getting some, getting some real work done. <laughs> <laughs>